Good day, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. So as I'm recording this, I was just chatting with our new guest co-host today about skiing and travel and lifestyle impacts. Uh, but today's guest co-host, maybe maybe we'll hit on more of that. Might not. We were chatting a lot before the mics went hot, uh, but he might know a little bit about a sustainable lifestyle, uh, some smart choices with what you're investing in, what you're spending your money on. Uh, what is the uh, a word that I've added to the show of the year? What is the legacy that you're impacting with your choices? Uh, so let me give you a quick background on this gentleman. He's the founder and vice president of sustainability at Pella. And, I, you know, it's funny. I saw commercials popping up in social media. Did not realize it was his product, it, you know, their brand, which is kind of exciting because I run social media for a lot of companies. And even I didn't pick up on it. But then they came out with this cool thing that I also had commercials hitting on my uh, social media for a <laughs> countertop composter. It's pretty fancy. It's pretty cool. So when uh, this agency reached out to me to chat with this gentleman, I'm like, wait a minute. I actually know about all the products and I care a lot about this planet and I do a ton of recycling. And we need to talk about how they've got a mission to impact and eliminate 10 billion people, billion pounds of waste. Uh, it's crazy. We have a big problem in this planet and we've made a big negative impact on this planet. And it takes people like this gentleman to help make a difference. So we still got a whole show ahead of us. We could just stop it right there, but without further, <laughs> further ado, Jeremy Langster, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Scott. Happy yeah. to be here. So it, it is funny. I was making a laugh because when I first got the information from Tom and his team, I was like, wait a minute, I know that product. And I did not realize you guys were the same company. I thought the Lomi thing was a whole different company. Yeah. And then I dug into it. And I was like, oh, of course I'm going to have them on the show. Because Amelia, I didn't, I didn't buy one of those yet. Uh, yeah. Because I, I actually do a lot of natural composting here. Great. And, but I did send your product months ago. Once those ads started popping up, I sent it to a few of my friends who live in a lot of you know dense city populations, yeah. Philadelphia, New York City. Uh, you were mentioning Chicago recently. Uh, I see that product excelling in those environments ex exponentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but but let's let's just pause on that. Sure. You've been at this mission for a while. If I remember correctly, if I read correctly, going back to like 07, right? You've been yes. a bit of a geek about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Long time, long time. Persistent. So what what triggered you? What was your truly a deep, deep oh, down, man? man? You're like, you know, I could start up this company, that company, this product, that product. But like, what? Well, it's just, you know, I have no I will put for my on the show. Like, what yeah, pissed you off? That's right. What, what, what pissed, pissed me off? <laughs> Plastic on the beach pissed me off. There you go. Yeah. That definitely, uh, but that yeah. in needles does not make me happy no, on the beach. <laughs> it's like seeing someone litter. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so Don't it goes back years before that, but yeah, it's like, uh, oh, I don't know where to start. I'll start with 2007 because I, you know, went to university, started climbing the corporate ladder. And you talk a, a lot about um, working on yourself and the mm -hmm. better people we become and closer to our authentic self, the better we show up in the world. And, you know, the more creative we are and all that stuff. So it was a, a long battle um, of uh, climbing the corporate ladder and doing very well for like seven years out of university, but had this voice in my head, like I just... I always wanted to start a company. I had these other dreams for this crazy stuff. So finally, I just got sick of the voices in my head and I started a company and I called it Open Mind Developments. Mm. And the idea was, this is in 2007, Open Mind for a Different View, Nothing Else Matters, Metallica. <laughs> and I just remember thinking about One of my first that. bands I started listening oh, to. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, for sure. Good stuff. So I started looking for problems to solve. And I always liked the idea of like, how can we make things better? Like as a child, I was curious, how does this work? How can we make it better? Sure. But yeah. So fast forward to Christmas of 2008, we're on vacation in Kauai. And my wife and our son were on this beautiful secluded beach and there were pieces of plastic everywhere. We're Ugh. playing in the sand. I'm like, who would litter on this beach? And why does my son have to dig in someone else's litter? Like who would do that? Yeah. And then when I got home, I learned about Pacific Gyre and that happened to be one of the most uh, plastic polluted beaches in the Hawaiian island chain. So, uh, but was it from an actual human being dropping it? No, no. it was from the, the ocean Pacific currents. Gyre, ocean currents. Yeah. Turns out it's from all of us, right? And plastic is this amazing material, but we don't have the end of life figured out. It just keeps building and building and building, and recycling's not working. So, wanted to find another solution uh, to that problem, and uh, started finding about about these biopolymers that were biodegradable, compostable. Trouble was they were very brittle at the time mm -hmm. and had very limited applications. So as a boy, I remember seeing farmers burning flax straw on the prairies here. 
and that thought that was wasteful. And my dad kind of said, like I said, if it's, you know, that strong, it must be good for something. He said, well, maybe when you get older, you can think of something. So just going back to conversations that are in your head and points in your life, thinking about what can we use this waste material for? Anyway, combined the two together and uh, kind of made a material called flax stick and then needed a product to apply it to. And iPhone 4 had come out. This is now 2010, 2011. Oh, yeah. And just wanted to solve that problem. The problem is people keep their phone for two years, yet the case to protect it will last for hundreds or thousands of years. It's just ridiculous and it won't be recycled. So started with Pila case in 2011 and, and grew it from there. So, yeah. And thank you for correcting me on that because uh, I usually try and do as much research as I can on proper word pronunciation, but oh, it's that's Pila, fine. not Pella. You know uh, what? It's, like it's Nike, funny because it, Pila, Pella, Pela doesn't matter. Yeah. And again, it's just simply P E L A ladies and gentlemen. So yeah. actually, you know, uh, Pila case.com yes. and it's a great concept because, so here's a fun background on me. Mm -hmm. Oh, six. I left the telecom world. I was a uh, analyst for uh, T-Mobile. I also had worked my way up in the corporate mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Then got into IT sales and consulting from 07 to 09. Wow. Uh, so while you were figuring that Amazing. out, I was doing that. Yes. And I went back to school on nights and weekends as an adult student, did my yeah. uh, a, a BS in marketing and psychology. And then uh, the book I published last year is called So You Want to Be a Hot Shot because I served as a hotshot while in firefighter with the federal government because after mm -hmm. I had the corporate career and the education, I decided none of that made sense and to give it all up yeah. and go be a firefighter. Wow. <laughs> so, and fight the big mountain fires, which you guys get up Amazing. in Canada as well. Yes, yeah. And wow. it's just funny because, now granted, when I first started that gig, anything I knew did not apply. It was like, okay, you know this, you know that, but they're like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Could you please just go dig in the dirt and yeah. you're well and grow out a mountain man beard and don't shower for two weeks. And wow. that, that was your life. <laughs> yeah. Watch out for bears. Right. <laughs> but I became a nut about cases because even when I worked with team mobile, I wasn't that big of a deal in the accessory market, but I did understand the racket as I called it Crazy. because back then they were doing, you know, the, the handset upgrades, right? So once yeah. you've been with the company a certain amount of time, yeah. You earn this much dollar value, and then you can upgrade your phone with a dollar discount. Now, fast forward to 2023 here. Now that doesn't even exist anymore. You just have to buy yeah. your phone outright. They're not giving you a, a per se discount. Like, mm -hmm. I have never spent so much on a phone until the past two years. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. And then this accessory market. Yes. So it's huge. My friends work in med, med device sales, right? Uh, Olympus headquarters is right here where I live. And they're a huge, not just Olympus cameras, but they have a huge medical device uh, side right. of the company. The endoscopes yeah. that go in, all this stuff. And a buddy uses the term, well, that's a there's a capital investment or capital expenditure, which is the main, you know, millions of dollars worth of endoscopic equipment. Mm -hmm. But then there's this accessory market. And that's really where they make the money. Yeah, it's all the cases and this, that, and the other thing that you can add on to that. Yeah, I, I might have spent a quarter million dollars, let's say, on that one piece of equipment uh, five years ago, but the gravy train is yes. the accessory market, consumables, and yeah, yeah. all that. Yeah, and then we apply that to what you guys did here with, with Pila, and it's like, yeah, well, I was buying, I was a firefighter, I'm in the mountains, so I bought, uh, you know, I bought two, whatever the at that time, it was 2010 and 2011, so. Whatever those tough cases were, I tried them all. Yes, yeah. They were bulky. There must have been three different types of plastics and rubbers and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. And then I ended up not liking it. And then I'm like, wait a minute, where did that go? I, I threw it exactly. out. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm beating myself up right now. No, that's great. Well, we tried to solve that problem. And uh, yeah, it kind of all went from there. It's so. crazy, though, that it's amazing how we have found, thanks to the power of petroleum, Yes. All these derivatives we can do, all these mm -hmm. plastics and rubbers and everything else. Uh, and admittedly, let's look at the cost of manufacturing. Let's chat about that real quick. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm a geek. Mm -hmm. And is to do what you did there, did that cost more? It did. Okay. But the reason, well, another reason what we liked about phone cases for yeah. <laughs> uh, high margins, so I could pay more for material. Mm -hmm. Small product, put it in the mail, ship it directly to consumers. Don't have to worry about the big gatekeepers yep. and getting into retail with low margin. So that's how early on we overcame that that margin difference. So, okay. But I mean, in the grand scheme of things, no, it's not that much more because your material costs, even if it's double on a phone case, your material costs, it's like yeah. you know, not, well, not to your that point, expensive. 
you're not uh, whatever all these big case manufacturers are now. Uh, it's especially the ones that are actually sold at the cell phone provider stores, right? Yes. The, the telecom provider stores, they have these big contracts. Well, you mm -hmm. know, that stuff's prime being pumped out of a factory in China. There is no care in the world over there about labor investment or quality of materials. It's just whatever is the cheapest way to make it. Let's just get it done. Yeah. And then they, you know, oh, yeah, I get it. Now you have, oh, it's a military spec case to handle this many impacts and blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, you guys must've had some fun. Oh yeah. It was <laughs> trying to fun. figure that out. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> and like, we try and keep it as simple as possible and we still do those tests. Like we have materials as, you know, our materials passed a lot of those materials. Yeah. The military impact drop tests test and all yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So, um, lots of fun. I mean, it was, uh, it was, a. Uh, you know, it, we were probably, I remember going to CES in like 2013 and basically getting laughed out of there. You know what I mean? And now everything's sustainable there. So it took yeah. a long time, um, but we had those audiences, it, you know, it's those little things that keep you going. We used to handwrite notes, my wife and I, like we were literally out of the basement for up until 2017. I met I my partners it. in 20, I love it. 2015, but really started working together in 2017, 2018, really clarified our mission to create a waste-free future and we can go there. But but those little handwritten notes and hey, hey Scott, thanks for your order, order and support. We're hoping you're having a great deal or a great day. Thanks for supporting us on our mission. Like those little things would make you feel good. And then sometimes we get your notes back. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate your product. Like those little wins that just keep you going Love long that. enough, you know, to persist and, and keep going at it. So, but yeah, it's uh yeah, I can yeah, that those first five years were really, really tough. Um yeah, Which they, what do they say? What is the answer? If you watch like uh, the Shark Tank shows and stuff like that, it's like the first five years has pretty much become like a textbook example of entrepreneurship. Like the first three years, it's just you, you're you're just ready to just it's in a, in a negatively psychological way of saying this. Oh. You're ready to just slice your wrist. You know, it's like I'm, I can't Absolutely. handle it. But if you make first the three. And yeah. they tell you, you have to keep reinvesting back into the business for the first five to truly build sustainability. Would you, right. Did that actually directly apply? Oh, absolutely. I worked a full-time job for 10, did this 10 years on the side. So I had two jobs. One was for free, Pila, nice. and the other yeah. one was a full-time job. And uh, so it's just, right, just keep going, keep picking away at it. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, but, you know, getting back to working on yourself. So I launched the first Pila case in 2011. Mm -hmm. It's basically my wife and I working on it and the kids, you know, out of the basement. <laughs> And but 2015, we got to the point where like I had these massive goals for this company and dreams, but I we were like, oh my god, like are we ever going to get there? And it's like we're putting in all this work and like, so I started work. I hired a coach, started mm -hmm. working with the coach, worked on my strengths and weaknesses, and then I realized that I needed, I knew how to make the product, I didn't know how to market, it, I didn't know how to scale it. So I applied to this entrepreneur event, which is very highly curated, like seven thousand applicants apply and only a hundred people get in, and I got vulnerable, and I got in. And that's where I met, I spent the last $10,000 in the company. I met Matt. He's my first partner, our co-founder, CEO, knew how to market it. And I met Brad, our chairman, knew how to scale. It was in the toy industry forever. So that's when things, like just when I got vulnerable, worked on myself, where am I strong yeah. and weak? What help do I need? That's when things really started to turn around. And when it went from, I've got this to we've got we've this, got yeah. right? And other guys saying, oh yeah, we can do that. I've done that before. Or I've seen companies do that. And these aren't crazy like, dreams. We can do it like that. And then just building out the team from there. It's it's great when you go from the I to we. Because uh, yeah. now granted, like I, I work for myself. I don't have a team, but mm -hmm. my contracts, my business relationships, I do look at that as we are a team. Like I, they're bringing me on. I'm, yeah, I mean, my, right now you're saying it. Even, exactly. On right? So thing. there is a we. Yeah. We got to mm -hmm. share. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it when guest co-hosts like you with not even a cue brings up the power of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I mean, it when I finally pulled my head out of my butt and realized what that means to yeah. success in life, not let alone business. I put mm -hmm. a whole chapter in my book because my, my wife got upset with me because she's like, why am I in your book? I'm like, well, because you're a big part of my transformation. You, yeah. you were the final trigger. To help me realize what vulnerability was all about. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I that initially that was about tying it into love mm -hmm. and trying to win her back because she had broken up with me before we even, you know, before we even hit the one year mark dating. Uh, <laughs> and because, and it, but again, after years of firefighting and living with you know nineteen other dudes and yeah. is you know it's just tough guy crap. Right. And then you know being a sales yeah. pro before that, and then getting back into what I'm very good at, right? Sales consulting, marketing, branding, and then 
thinking that you have to keep like acting like you got everything together and blah, 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 blah. blah. And it's like, no, 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 actually it's okay oh, to man. show some weakness and vulnerability. Let's figure this out. And, Absolutely. And when you're but, around people like that. It's so, so would you say your family helped you awaken that vulnerability trait? Where'd that come from? Yeah. Or was it the yes. coach? I would say family first, then coach, but getting back to this entrepreneur event, it's MNT yeah. mastermind talk, Jason Gaynard. Like it was like unbelievable. When I got there night one, there's all these entrepreneurs who have like, you know, massive companies, but it was curated. Like you had to have high values. If you're an asshole, you got, you weren't allowed in there. <laughs> so, but the first night I got there and I basically called my wife and I broke down and I said, I do not belong here. I just got this little company that makes this phone case. And you know what I mean? And I like kind of wanted to go home And the next day just got to know everyone and saw everyone get vulnerable and realizing that they're struggling with the same things that I'm struggling with. And like, oh, now I have people I can talk with who understand where I'm coming from. And it was just like, yeah, it felt like I was home. That was the big. It, it's that's how, you know, you went to a really great event, like you're referring to, mm -hmm. or let's say a great mastermind event. And that's something yeah. I've learned from people way more successful than me already just in the past five years. And it's just the truly high, if you let's sorry, let's pause. Defining success is in many different facets. It could yeah. be, it's not always about the dollars. It could just right. be, hey, man, I, I launched a company. It's actually growing. I've built a team like you've done, and I'm still married with children, and we're happy. That could be success right there. You don't need the bank account. Right. You know, right. Some people look exactly. at it different ways. Exactly. And what I've found is most highly successful people, including like some of these you know sharks in the shark tank, people like Damon mm -hmm. Joe, these guys admit like – if you get into a room with other highly successful multi-million billionaire, if you're going to assign a dollar sign, they're not going to talk about their successes. They're going to talk about those biggest challenges, those biggest mm -hmm. hiccups. And that's profoundly awakening. It's like, oh, they're not here just touting their success because right. they don't need to. Exactly. They don't need to stroke their ego. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, wow, the fact that they have no problem bringing up something they dropped the ball yeah. on 15 years ago. Right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and that hits, right? We can yeah. feel that. Like, that's right. Like, okay. So you must have been like, oh. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was. It was a game changer for sure. Yeah, life changer. So, by the way, what did your wife say to you when you were saying you don't belong here and stuff like that? Did she call you out and say, you know no, what? No, she didn't. She said, you do belong there. You know, you All work right. hard at this and you do like that. She, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Supportive and coach. That's a, that's a great wife. That's, yeah, I, I mean, I, it's funny. We, we pay for coaches in business or in personal, like you said. <laughs> uh, and it's like, that all wrong it was right there <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely so lucky yeah you know what it. we talk about your teammates and your business but your 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 partner your family your spouse or you know significant other those are your first partners in business yeah. on paper or not because you're the they're the ones who deal with all your crap and crazy well especially if you're making down. possible major financially oh. decisive decisions and it's like granted you were smart you kept the full-time hustle going while yes. you built the part-time hustle. Yeah. I made that mistake years ago. I'm like, oh, I'm going to start this business idea and just go all in. Right. And the level of stress that came out of oh. it, because I didn't, I ha I wasn't making money equal to where I was at. Even if I cut the yeah. budget back, it was, it was very, very stressful. And that's something that if I fast forward all these years later, if I ever had to coach anybody on that, I'm like, Dude, don't be afraid to hold on to the full-time thing. You don't yeah. know if that's right. And there's all these people out there saying, oh, you just got to dive in. No. Got to be head it's like first. like burn the bullets. But like, I yeah. remember talking to an entre a seasoned entrepreneur when I was like deciding if I should quit my full-time job. And he's like, like, I should, should I burn the boats? And he said, well, you can't burn your boat when you're in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Ooh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that is so good. But yeah, for sure. Well, and also uh, why burn the boats? Uh, why well, can't yeah. we have... It just it's just at the dock, dude. It's just there. Again, eventually, yeah. then you then you, then you can right. sell it. That's an asset. <laughs> like, yeah, don't burn it. Absolutely, sell it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, for sure. There are more options here. And that you know what? I also remember reading about companies who um, don't burn the boats or startups. They actually do better in the long run mm -hmm. because you have more time to get through that three year, five year hump. You know, find your audience, find your market, product market fit, like all of that stuff. So yeah. that was a. You know, just getting back to lifelong learning and reading things and getting examples and other mentors and stuff like that. It really helps along the way. Well, and real quick, because I'd love to do this for YouTube, I'm going to screen share the site quick. Because so pilacase.com, ladies and gentlemen, and I love the marketing. 
right? Thanks. 30% less carbon emissions, 34% yeah. less water usage, 80% less waste production. We could just stop right there, but I also love the fact that, you know, you guys start off as a phone case company, mm -hmm. but now do so much more. Yes. So, and obviously we're going to have to get into the whole Lomi thing. Too. So For sure. it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see this growth, this scaling. Mm -hmm. And like, how long was it just the case? Like just well, the phone like case. from 2011 to 2021. Okay. All right. Now so, what triggered yeah, the, years. The, what triggered the transition into sure. other products? Was it just like, wait a minute, no, this is solid enough. Let's let's consider other things. Was customers asking for it? What triggered the other products? Yeah. It was solving our problem. Okay. Our big problem. In 2018, when the three of us partners came together and we really clarified our vision and our mission. And our mission, our crazy goal was to create a waste-free future. Cool. By creating everyday products without everyday waste. So not just the product waste, but like packaging waste. And are we wasting energy or time? Or how can we use our product as a force of good? And how can we support nonprofits? And how can we build the most sustainable, environmentally friendly product or company in the world? So that was our basis point. So we have this compostable phone case and we're growing and building and like really like, you know, top, top growth company in Canada for a couple of years in a row, like crazy growth. And as we're growing, we're always like, can we get better? How can we better? We believe in better. We don't believe in perfection. I like that. Just get better, get better, little steps. So um, what we realize is that we have this compostable phone case that's, you know, we compared it to a conventional plastic case and like all the things you listed, it's better than all that. But mm -hmm. our ultimate goal is it for, to go back to the earth at the end of its life. So what we realize is that not everyone has home compost or compost like you have. Not everyone has access to industrial compost and industrial composters really don't like compostable plastic products. Let's, they let's don't pause know. on that real quick. Yeah. In, when you say industrial composting, yes. are, like here in the States, um, well, obviously like we have a, a sanitation company, like the, where I bought this house last year, uh, they already have a contract. It's, it's our, I'd have to really pick anybody. My old house, we right. pick. This is already decided by the township or the, the area that we live in. That's the partner. And that has to go somewhere. So then there is a full-blown, I guess you want to call it an industrial trash and or recycling center. Yes. Is yeah. that what you're referring to? Like these, yeah. these your, ones that support towns and cities? Yeah, organics waste collection or your green bin program where they take your yard waste and maybe your food case waste, hopefully, and goes to a compost facility. And they turn it into compost and they sell the end product. Okay. If there's plastic in it, there's compostable plastic that is, you know, it has to meet all the certifications and breaks down. And like, mostly it's meant for food packaging. So you get bags of like yard waste. Yeah. That bag will be compost and will go back to the earth. Unfortunately, the compost facilities, a lot of them don't have the resources to read every label or know if everything's compostable. So a lot of it will get screened out and end up in landfill. So that's broken. So recycling's not working. Nope for plastic and uh, compostable plastic infrastructure. They need a lot of support. So there's anyway, so I'm getting to, so we're like, okay, our phone case, what if we take it back? So we did a Pila 360 program. So when you order a Pila case, you just put your stamp on the envelope, Ooh. send it back to us. So that was successful and we still do that. And we grind it up and sell it as our reborn collection. Then we get it back, Ooh. grind it up, send it to a compost facility when we can't use it. That's the ultimate sustainable way. So, to, so that's yeah. a good, that's a good piece or angle, right? If, if we know that the larger way of life is not working, that's yes. one way you can at least control a percentage yeah, of we'll your market. Yeah. We call it the that. responsibility economy. We take responsibility for what we make. So if every company did that, we'd be in a lot better place. So, but then we're <laughs> like, what if we went a little step further? What if we created a uh, little mini composter that everyone had and decentralized, democratized waste management that it could take our compostable phone case, but also other compostable product, products. But along the way, we also discovered how wasteful food waste was going to landfill. Oh, yeah. So that's the biggest thing. That's When plants and animals die, <laughs> they're supposed to go back to the earth. That's yeah, it's nature's called fertilizer. fertilizer. <laughs> it's called nature's <laughs> fertilizer. Right. There was never need, a need for synthetic fertilizer in nature. So we're Wait, hold on. I got to pause previous. on that. Yeah. Could you say that one more time? Yeah. When there was never a need for synthetic fertilizer in nature, Thank when you. plants and animals die, they're supposed yeah. to go back to the earth. They have everything that the plants need, the soil need to grow the next generation mm -hmm. and let, repeat the cycle. When yeah. we take food scraps and put it in a landfill and it creates methane, that's like the worst thing we can do. So anything we can do to make it easier to keep food scraps out of the landfill and get it back into the earth to regenerate the soil, that's a win. And also along the way, we've created a, the bridge, the gap between the compostable product manufacturer, like packaging in bags, like for our phone case 
and the compost facilities. Now we have, if everyone had a Lomi, or what, when these are decentralized and democratized and ubiquitous, they can put all their, you know, all their food scraps and their compostable plastics in their Lomi and it goes back to the earth. Pretty so cool. we're not waiting around for, you know, billions and billions of dollars to, for the infrastructure and the government to put all these things in place. We can, consumers can make the change and you're creating a really valuable product in Lomi Earth. Well, and, and like, so is this, is this like most compactors? I watched all the videos too, but I'm just doing it yeah. for the show too. I'm uh, screen sharing again. Um, is it all about pressure or no? It comes down to the ingredients and how easy it is to compost. Yeah, it's, well, are you talking about the, how the actual machine works? The machine works, about right. The, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was like, does it really need yeah. a ton of pressure or not really thanks to what you're, because we're, we're putting food, but uh, you're, to your point, we're, thanks to how you guys make your products, those yeah. can be put in there too. Absolutely. The big focus is food after we're going to, we're going to solve the food waste problem. Number one, next, we're going to solve the plastic waste problem. And we're working on the synthetic fertilizer problem. too. <laughs> so three big uh, industries were challenging, but I always give the example, like when an apple falls to the ground, depending on where it is, if you're up in Canada in the winter, it might take a year to actually fully break down and biodegrade. If it's in your compost pile and you're, it might take, there's more energy, more heat, more microorganisms it might take months or weeks in Lomi. We, we just accelerate that process and help okay. break it down and get it to a point where it can, you know, go back to the earth as easily as possible. So I like we, we talk about mimicking nature and like there is no waste in nature. Humans are the only species to, that create waste. So what if, what if garbage was optional? Like I said, what if everything you consume from your food scraps to your food containers to your phone case could go back to the earth? It, it cracks me up do. because like last night was trash night. So I my new house is on a mountainside here. So I decided to stretch the legs. And I just hiked my, I just a kitchen size trash bag. That's all I had yeah. from the whole week for my right. wife and I now, cause they had these big, the big, you know, they had robot arm trucks to come pick everything yeah. up. So I got like the big trash one, the big recycling one, all of my neighbors, their cans are overflowing. Now granted, some of my neighbor on the, on the hill here has kids and stuff, yeah. but it's just my wife, myself and a dog. And we recycle so much to your point. Right. That doesn't mean it's all being recycled, right? but it's right. I it's, literally yeah. have going to the garbage. I get one yet. kitchen trash bag a week. So it's, it's like the whole can's empty, but then my recycling can's full. <laughs> right. But so, you have compost, right? You have home compost. I have a home compost. Yeah. Bin if, yeah. So yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, again, there's tricks to that. You have to know how to rotate it and flip it. And then you got to add other materials in like it's grass hard. clippings and leaves and everything else. So, yeah, it's not easy. Lomi makes it easy. That's no. what we're trying to do. Like okay. make it as easy as possible. Push a button. And the stickiness of it, when you see your food waste turn into like dirt Nothing. in like hours or not, yeah. and, they, and you see it and you put on your plants and it helps your plants grow. Like it, it's just, it's really sticky and amazing. And just it's helps. funny because like when you watch the video and it's like, wait, wait, so what? Do you have to buy a bag of dirt and the, the machine adds the dirt in? Right. And then to that's your point, crazy. you're like, no, it's, that's what. Dirt that's is. what happens. Yeah, that's what dirt is. It's organic matter, and the soil is starving for organic matter. Oh, it's so. like I have uh, three acres here. I'm surrounded yeah. by woods. So, like, I, uh, I, I've only been here. We're well, coming up on two years in May, and I decided I'm going to build my own trail because I'm a mountain biker and a hiker, and we have a dog, and I want a place to walk it. So I'm going through, and I'm just clearing out some things, and I'll yeah. and just years of leaf leaves Literally, coming down. Yeah, right? Yeah, if you yeah. you go below just two inches down, and yeah. there's the dirt. Well, what do you think? that there was like nobody's Absolutely. touched these woods in years no. it's just that's nature down. and the best soil has the most organic matter like Absolutely. the darkest thickest black soil it has the most organic matter in it so when we you know farm and pull everything out yeah. and send it to the land that's like you know it's like the kiss the earth uh you know uh, well as a guy who grew up yeah. in farming even yeah. i knew that like with the crops we rotated as a kid are not the crops we're rotating today. That's a whole other right. podcast. I mean, right. yeah, we, regenerative agriculture is yeah, like yeah. corn, it, yeah. it rapes the earth. Yeah. So soybeans actually rapes the earth. We planted a ton of alfalfa as a kid, yeah. and that's what the animals wanted to that's eat. That's right. Yeah. You know, and then yeah, because it's a cash crop back then, not at nearly it is now. Yeah, then we rotated corn, but then we had to get alfalfa and other products back onto those fields, or else the soil was getting robbed. And Absolutely. then we would have had to find a way to afford, you know, store bought or, you know, ag way bought, uh, fertilizers. fertilizers so yeah. We never spread fertilizers on the fields. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah. And you had the manure probably from the dairy operation too, right? Like, Oh God. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Like everything. Yeah. Trust me. I had a 1955 <laughs> rust red farm all tractor 
with a with a shit spreader and yeah. that was the first thing i learned to drive it was a three speed <laughs> yeah. and it was a it was a mechanical clutch like you basically oh, yeah. when you were done driving yeah, you, that you're your right. calf muscle yeah, looked like you were all roided out right like <laughs> and you're, when you're smaller you had to like pull on the steering wheel to oh yeah and it's a big metal steering off. wheel and then, yeah. i mean dude that was the first thing i learned to drive yeah but yeah, yes. everything from the pigs, the cattle, the the chickens, yeah. like I, I sold eggs on the side of the road. That was my first business. I was Amazing. 13 years old. And yeah, but now like, all of a sudden everything's so complicated nowadays. Yeah. I'm like, well, how, how do we make fields more sustainable? I'm like, I'm only 45 years old. <laughs> That's right. Did and really I can tell you how to do that. <laughs> no, it's crazy. I don't have a PhD. Do you have a PhD? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> Apparently there's some innovation going on here. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's simple. Nature's so simple. We just well, got to help it along. Right. Well, and again, what I love about your machine is it's not just the, now, all right. So here, let's throw, let's throw a wrench in here. Yeah. How do how do you respond to people on the power consumption factor? Right? Well, first of all, just because you plug, you got to plug in, it in. The, yeah. It doesn't so. mean it's bad. No, no. <laughs> and I you mean, know, everything, everything that get... I'm up, my studio is plugged in. I, I mean... know. And like, I hopefully you're doing good with it. And I know you are, but I mean, yeah. there are people who are doing negative things with all their older stuff. So oh, yeah. two things, I mean, we can talk science and I will. And, and, uh, but I mean, just the fact that like a lot of people, most people have dishwashers. Yep. You don't need to use a dishwasher. You could wash your dishes by hand. <laughs> so, so why get... is that so weird? When I met my wife, she's like, and we, I moved in with her years ago. And, and I got rid of my place and we did the whole yeah. cohabitation thing. And she goes, why do you wash dishes so much? I was like, well, after leaving fire, I was still living a very simple life. So I had this cheap, crappy apartment when I met her. And I'm like, yeah. I didn't have a dishwasher and I'm one person. That's right. I probably washed the same plate almost every single day. Absolutely. Like, now all of a sudden oh. we're told to fill it, fill a machine. And like, yeah. Or I just wash the same plate every day. I still do it I to know. this day. So funny. <laughs> That one plane is a key. I remember in university, we used to have lots of plates and it would just pile up because we had to wash oh. it by hands. And we're like, we got to get rid of all these plates. Hey, one of my one first plate, paid jobs, <laughs> I was I was milking cows at a dairy farm as my first job. And I, would, I rode my 10 speed bike to get there. And then I rode up the other way on the weekends and worked as a dishwasher at a restaurant. Amazing. So, and yes, they had the whole machine. You fill the yes. rack, you fill, but again, yeah. we were serving hundreds of people. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so, it makes sense. So yeah. my point is, at least when you plug in your Lomi, it does something good for the environment, <laughs> right? <laughs> Very <laughs> true. Yeah. So, but I mean, it's less than, and the other thing is we're not trying to solve the, uh, the uh, electrical grid generation issue. No. Like non That's a whole bigger problem. Yeah. And it's, I believe one day we're going to get there <laughs> and it's going to be quicker than like one day energy will be renewable. So, but we've, we've run all the numbers and it depends on if you're in Texas or California, like your, your carbon footprint is more or less, but number, if, if you're plugging it in anywhere in the U.S. or North America, pretty much, and you're as long as you're not sending your end product to the landfill, mm -hmm. it's a win because you're keeping it out of the landfill and it's either going in your backyard or in your farm or your thing. So you're you're ahead from a carbon footprint standpoint. And we also are climate neutral certified, so we measure our carbon footprint every year. We try as best we can to lower our carbon footprint, but the stuff that we can't lower anymore, we purchased offsets, carbon credits. Nice. So when Lomi arrives at your door, all the manufacturing, all the transportation and your phone case, tequila case, you're at zero. So that's oh, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that because I used to yeah. live in Colorado after firefighting. Mm -hmm. And back when I used to drink beer, I don't drink beer anymore, but um, there's this great sustainable brewery. These people were obsessed yeah. about it. And actually they're huge in the mountain biking world because they make what I know is fat tire beer. Is yes, actually the fat tire. It's huge. Yes. Well, so they mm. were founded in Fort Collins, Colorado. Okay. And I started going up there on weekends because I lived down in uh, Golden, just below Boulder, outside of Denver. And I found a, a biking charity, getting kids on bikes. I, I was commute up there every weekend. And then we go to the brewery. But dude, they were they made sure it was all part of their brand. They had mm -hmm. a water recycling like sphere out back. It was this huge thing. They were recycling all their wastewater, all the beer. Uh, uh, they were contacting all the local farms to take all the stuff they used to make the beer and then yeah. they specifically contracted with wind farms and solar farms and that's got to be the greenest brewery that i've yeah i think ever it is. been to so. yeah it's amazing and it's so smart so yeah and it's fun and it's sustainable and it's you know so yeah. well to your point if we are going to create a possible footprint on the planet are you taking these extra harder steps that in the long run 
is going to impact a positive legacy over time. This is one of the reasons why I brought you on because again, over years of podcasting, I started incorporating this. I realized, and just like me, when I wrote my book, that's for charity. Like I'm not taking any money right. from that. That's, that's all I started wow. a charity and the book benefits my charity. So Amazing. it's, it's like, okay, well, I, I already know how to make money. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to make money from everything. Right. <laughs> but if exactly. you are going to make money. Yeah. Feel good about how you're doing it. It makes it a lot easier to get stressed out and like run a business and, and hit these new quotas. Cause like, I know that in the long run, right? Like we're doing something good. Yes. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to geek out with you about deep, deep oh, down. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, I think it's huge. Like on the, just even being a mission-based company, mm. the people we attract are top, top caliber team members who could work for any company they want to pretty much, but they want to use their skills as a force of good. <laughs> I love Not it. just selling another widget. I'm selling something that actually can make a difference in the world. And yeah. they see the bigger picture. And, you know, our crazy goal is, now we want it. We change it. Now we're going to eliminate 10 billion pounds of waste a year and create 2 billion pounds of loamy earth, which can help with nature's fertilizer to regenerate the soil. That's 10 million loamies. Each loamy can do about a thousand pounds a year. Well, 10 yeah. million is not that crazy. We've been only been in market like about a year and we already have 150,000 units out there. And the cool part that we're seeing is that 50% of our customers have never composted before. So we're getting them into the composting game and 25% have composted before, but they quit because it was too hard. So we're getting them back in the game. I love we're that. People do like to quit when things get hard. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, so we have our impact report and what we're trying to do with that. And uh, we also donate. We're big into educating and inspiring next generation. So it's about, are we being good ancestors? I think maybe you've heard that before, but that type of thinking um, are we leaving the pro the planet better than oh, we found it? Yeah, like we're not. So far, we're not. But you're, you're no, making, we're a, you're making a right step. <laughs> we're trying. It's not easy. <laughs> but I mean, that's the way we look at things, right? And uh, I was talking, one of our favorite sayings, or my favorite one, it's a First Nations elder saying. And you know, First Nations, they look like mm -hmm. seven generations out, like long term. Um, and they're, they're, it's, uh, we are the people we've been waiting for. Mm. There's not some magical group of people over there who are going to solve the world's problems. Right. It's us. You know what I mean? That type of thing. It also gives you confidence that, yeah, we actually can do it. We are the people. You know, it, it, I, I can't remember if it was a mission statement or a vision state, but as, as a former corporate guy, you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was with T-Mobile, I got to say back then, I actually gave it to this day. I'll still give them some respect. They were trying. They mm -hmm. were definitely not the typical because I worked for a couple other companies that were all like acquired over time and then became T-Mobile. Yes. So I started wow. early stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, but one of the missions or vision statement was, and I use this when I coached and trained my teams was we are all personally and collectively accountable for our results. And I'll never forget that statement to this mm -hmm. day. Cause now it's, it's been applied in so many other ways in my life and professionally, and even what we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. if each of us just took a little bit more accountability yeah. for what we're doing individually, and then aligned with other companies organizationally, like we're talking about right now, personally, and then collectively, I was like, oh my God, that thing still applies right here. It's mm -hmm. just, but it does come back to us individuals. Yes, choices. Yeah. Yeah, and like the power of the consumer. And, you know, it, in, a, in a perfect world, if you have a sustainable product and a non-sustainable product, but they're exactly the same, just one's more sustainable than the others, yeah. and customers are choosing that sustainable one over the non-sustainable one, Yeah. well, you're going to start taking lunch away from the non-sustainable companies, taking their food out of their mouths. <laughs> and eventually they're either going to have to make their products more sustainable or they're going to go to business. I mean, that's a, a perfect way of thinking about how economics and how consumers can drive that change. I'm not about this with my own wife. I mean, when I met, she and I were definitely big recycling people. And, mm -hmm. and um, but then like just literally just last week, I said, hey, I know you have to have this specific laundry detergent because if she gets like irritated skin, if, if it's not completely hyperallergenic and clean. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm also very big into all the bad stuff anyway, chemicals, everything else. Yeah. So I've had so many PhDs and scientists on this show over the years. It's, I know too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, which is great. And yeah. that's why I hope my listeners have gained from that too. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, wait a minute. Well, babe, you do know that they make your detergent in powder form. And she's like, why? And I was like, those plastic jugs cannot yeah. be recycled properly. Right. You know, that's just one decision right yeah. there. That giant yeah, jug. Yeah. She goes to Costco at corporation, you know, gets the big giant jug. And now granted it lasts for months and months. Cause it's just two of us. But I said, right. let me just, let me just make that decision for us. I'm getting mm -hmm. you the same quality product 
It's just in powder form versus liquid form, no plastics. That's Paper recyclable box. cardboard yeah. uh, box, yeah. you know, and then, or little things like we're big dog lovers. Okay. There's lots of different kinds of poop bags out there. Right. Oh yes. They all claim to be biodegradable. But okay. Is it a sustainable company? Yeah. Is, are the plastics truly biodegradable? Right. I geek out. I research everything. I'm that weird. Mm -hmm. I know it's, like, it's tricky. And then where do you put it? And who but, takes and then, dog poop? Well, yeah, it's like, great. You made the first it's step. Tricky. And then the next step, yeah. But then, okay, is that going in the landfill? Is that affecting right. methane? Now, granted, I will say the landfills that are near here in Pennsylvania, they're all they, uh, five, five to 10 years ago. I see this massive plant being built, and it's a methane harvesting plant. So the city of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, there's a whole methane harvesting facility pulling that stuff out of the landfill because it's already there, yeah. and then converting it into energy to be used by the citizens here. And I was like, I had no idea that was what yeah, that methane thing was. collection. It's good, but it's not yeah. as efficient as I think we think. This no, is the other thing, is, but I mean, it it's is. a step. Hey, they're trying. Anytime you're trying, <laughs> I, I give everyone credit because it's yeah. not it's not easy, and we all need to try to make those little steps. So, well, and and the cool thing about your technology with the Lomi is is like, it's not rocket science per se. It no. and also. I, cause I, I studied microelectronics technology when I was in high school. I'm like, I'm a geek. And I know that tech like this does not need to pull high levels of current. So yeah, I always tell people if your electric bill is not managed by total utilization here in the States, anyway, my electric bill is measured by power spikes. So like when your HVAC system kicks on those massive pieces of equipment that pull massive amounts of right. current, right. that's actually what you're getting billed for because that's putting the strain on the grid and they're having to right. supply that. If you can have low consistent energy utilization appliances like that, yeah. that is not actually taking as much, I guess, utilization as you would think. Now, granted, right. I'm not your wow. science team, but no, am no, I doing, am I doing okay? It's, you're doing great. It takes less <laughs> energy than a, a cycle of a dishwasher. Like one cycle in Lomi is like half, less than half the energy wow. you in your dishwasher. And I did not read then, that stat. That's pretty impressive. And this is version one. Like we're, we're, we're going to make it a lot more efficient as we go. So that is super cool. Mm -hmm. ha around half of a dishwasher yeah and, and again you're, and now here's the best part people like planting flowers now all of a sudden thanks to the pandemic all kinds of people were doing home gardens again stuff like yeah. that there's your fertilizer but absolutely so you don't need to done, go buy bags of fertilizer you're bags right of so dirt. the 100 or 200 dollars you spend on fertilizer and driving down to your home depot to pick up your big bag and haul it back yeah well you have it you have it right here. It's your food scraps. That's I, I love and we've that. done testing in soil testing on like uh, nonprofit farms that provide food for the hungry on like cabbage and lettuce and broccoli. And we're, we apply loamy earth at the same application rate as compost and organic fertilizer. And we're seeing just as good and better results with loamy earth. There's so much more to it than it's just not nutrients. There's everything in it that the, the soil needs. I just had on, actually, I just aired a I don't normally do this. I'd aired two shows at the same exact time, a back-to-back -back episode, part one, part two. Randy Lee literally just got released this week as you and I are recording it. Mm -hmm. um, he's a geek and I love it because he released yeah. a couple different books. He's a health nut, but um, he, what's it called? Bionutrient.org. There's this dude that, again, I learned so much on the shows, yeah. but they developed a scanning device that they can literally just scan, like sense the nutrient density, the technology is now there, nutrient density of in fruits plants. and vegetables. So they've already got the first mocked up device being that's been tested already, but you know, it, this is coming. And yeah. he, so he, we called the, uh, the episodes, uh, the real food wave. But part of the reason behind this is because they've done the research just because it says organic does not mean it's actually nutrient dense just right. because it's all natural does not yeah. mean it's nutrient dense. You're just paying for a badge of how stuff is being raised and stuff like that. Hopefully no chemicals, but what really matters is the nutrient density. The density. Absolutely. And the amazing results we've taken plant the samples of the broccoli and the lettuce yeah. and sent it to the lab and compared and we're seeing more dense nutrients in it. There you go. And it seems crazy, but it really is not because that's nature's fertilizer. And like right. you said at the beginning, it has it all figured out. So yeah, that's exciting. And, and you know, we look at um, even in agriculture, you hear, you know, it used to always be about the, how big can we get the corn kernel and the wheat kernel because yield and like volume, but no, now they're finally churning and like how much protein can we get it? How many nutrients? Let's make it smaller and more dense and more efficient and more sustainable and more regenerative. <laughs> like oh, there's a whole pod. I, I could geek out just yeah. about what we did to grains. First of all, I don't consume yeah. grain. A lot of grains are inflammatory to the body anyway, but yeah. what we did to agricultural here with our science 
Right. They actually spun things the wrong direction. Yes. You know, there's actually countries in Europe still growing the original strains of wheat, for example. Mm -hmm. They don't have all of these other negative side effects that we're seeing over in this country. Things of the inflammatory trigger, yes. uh, gluten, how the protein profiles have changed because we decided we need to make more money. So, hey, let's shrink the stock you know, so it doesn't get blown over and destroyed and win more. This is decades of, right. of change yeah, yeah, that we created yeah. here. Mm -hmm. But the side I effects is we're overplanting, over raising because we have to consume more because the nutrient yes. density isn't there. To your point, right now we're using false fertilizers and all this yeah. stuff. And there's yeah. all these negative side effects. It's yeah. And it's tricky. I have a bachelor of science in agriculture. So I get, you know, it was, we have to do this to feed the world sure. basically at the time, but I think now it's coming back to like, it's finally the talk is not just yield. Like right. you said, it's density. So that's great. Yeah. And it's, it's just refreshing that you guys, first of all, it's also refreshing. You found people to align with, right? Your co-founders, if you will, yeah, the, the, the team that you, cause let's say it's like, yeah. okay, it's like, let's, let's, let's figure this out together. It, and, that's one of the most rewarding things, even early on when it was just like, when I talked, talked about sending notes is you'd meet people with similar values, <laughs> they actually care. You know what I mean? And it, it takes also, a while. It, feels like it takes a while. It takes a while, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean to find partners and then now teammates, and it's just like how you know it's the mastermind effect. Like one plus one equals ten. You know, you get more people focusing on a problem. You have more solutions and better solutions, and it's just like it's amazing. Yeah, if happen. the passions are aligned, yeah, it's exciting. The, the world is your oyster, so to speak, right? Yeah, is that get wow? Yeah, and obviously yeah, and look, look how far direction. you guys have come. Like yeah, when you found those guys, you weren't even at this stage yet. It, it's no. just cool to see a journey like this. Yeah. Thanks. It's, uh, yeah. The power of a team and yeah. getting the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus or getting the people playing the right position positions, you know, sports analogies and all that stuff. And yeah, it's, uh, so, so how far have you, has your, have your devices made around the world yet? Yeah. Below me? Pretty okay. much. Uh, do you have one of those like North America, country, we, country tickers? Did, I got that one, got that one. <laughs> we, we have it state by state and province by province. And we do have the numbers because we're right now we're mostly D to C. We're working to get into retail. So we sure. know exactly where they're sold. So yeah, uh, UK, uh, Europe, North America, Canada, Australia kind of thing. So Super yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's neat to see. And you hear about other areas in the world where like Japan and China, they don't have compost industries or compost facilities. So literally these devices, they need these devices. Or like you look at even like, um, oh, uh, Dubai or, you know, those places where they're living in the sand, and they, yeah. have, they waste the most food. But if we could turn all that food and get it back in the soil and actually- Look turn at countries like into... China. There's, yeah. is it, there, there's a, I don't know if it's China or Indonesia. There's literally a mountain. Like I just saw this the other night. Oh, the track holes? The, the yeah, where, they, where they're passing the trash up yeah. the mountain. Yeah. That is nuts. It's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, but it exists. It and exists. the only difference here in this country, in the U S anyway, is that we're burying it under a mountain That's or right. putting it onto a big freighter ship. And hopefully it doesn't sink because it goes across the ocean or we are dumping it in the ocean I back know. to your it's beach. Point. It's so and then crazy. what is that thing called again out in the Pacific? The giant the Island Pacific of trash. Gyre. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's plastic. now granted that, that one dude, uh, invented that conveyor belt system to be pulled yeah. behind the ships to pull all that stuff yeah. up. Here's yeah. my question. Does that solve the problem? No, right? it, we, could, we could pick it up, but where's it going from there? That's right. I mean, so the, we got to look, there are many, we have to do a, a bunch of different things to solve the problem. One yeah. is let's clean up those the oceans and the beaches and yes. we can use that plastic, but until chemical recycling comes on board, you can only recycle something so many times. So ultimately yeah. it's going to land in a landfill. Yeah. We're trying to use, you know, as many renewable materials as we can focus on the end of life compostable goes back to the earth, but Use it as many times as you can. And when you're done with it, then it goes back to the earth, you know, fertilizes the, the plants. You can grow more crops and create more mm -hmm. products out of it and repeat the cycle. So again, uh, just mimicking nature. And there's other countries or companies or countries making a difference. I know, I think it's either Sweden or Switzerland um, that has found a way to do an incineration process with a much like, it's like, it's crazy. Like I, I, I was right. just reading an article about a month ago about this. I had to go back and look at how far they've come along, but supposedly they're able to do some type of incineration, clean incineration process, and then capture that and generate energy from the process and power towns with it. It's right. Pretty Without cool. polluting stuff right. off the stack. So that's, exactly. neat. that's the goal. I mean, the technology yeah. That's what's exciting is technology is getting better and better. I was just at an event in Chicago and it was uh, one company. I can't remember the name of it. Actually, it's called uh, UBX, Ubiquitous. 
they take landfill garbage, plastic, everything mixed together, organics, and they create a, a plastic pellet out of it. And then they can then use that to make products. So they're using waste to make products and you it's can't like a recycle fuel pill. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but it's, you know, that the products aren't, it's more like crates and containers, like milk still. crates, but I mean, still it's benches and they're, it's another way. So yeah. what, what we're excited about is like the, we're just getting going with technology and how to make better materials, how to, you know, have better end of life options. So we all give the example of like, we literally like exponential technologies and, and you creating a whole new category around, around smart waste technology and smart waste appliances. That's what we're trying to do. But like how we used to get oil from whales. And then we used to, we figured out to use technology to drill into mountains, to get coal for energy. And then we figured out to drill in the ground. Now we're figuring out how to harness the sun. Well, yeah. same thing. We used to put our food waste in the garbage. Yeah. And then we figured out how to compost it. But now we figured out how to make it even easier for, so more people can compost it and like that type of thing. So. It would be exciting in our lifetime to stop creating mountainsides of trash. It would well, be good. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. We it. <laughs> well, well, listen, we're, we're coming to the end of the show. Um, oh, it's fast. I'm, I know, right? We see what, when you align. And, yeah, exactly. And it's like, wow, it was an hour already? <laughs> wow, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's just crazy how cool you guys. I, by the way, again, great job on the website. Actually, I'm gonna screen share one more time yeah. because uh, there's just so many. Again, people just go to the website and dig in at lomi.com as well because I things like this, like you know, CO2 emissions. All yeah. right, just being able to look at a simple graph and mm -hmm. understand that this one little appliance is actually doing that much of a difference. Yeah. And this is only your first generation product. First generation. And just imagine when, like I said, the 10 billion pounds, that's 10 million Lomis. Well, that that's not that crazy. And now no. I think maybe it's like, you know, it's like before dishwashers and after dishwashers, before smart waste appliances and after. And if everyone had one, like just uh, we can really make a big, big difference. Oh, know? yeah. So, well, and again, yeah. again, you're not just aligning here, helping people understand that's a dishwasher, that's a regular oven yeah. or stove in your kitchen, that's a laundry machines. Oh, my God. I mean, when yeah, I was a kid, yeah. I don't know if I had a dryer. If we did, we hardly ever used it. We hung our laundry outside. Yeah, and, that's right. You know. It works great, except yeah. in the winter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we're we have an amazing laundry, team. But... I mean, everyone is so creative. That's what's fun also about, you know, we're trying to solve this problem and everyone gets to be creative. And mm -hmm. as humans, we are creative beings. That's how we survive, right? And I truly believe that. People it. just be creative. It's amazing what can happen. I truly believe that. I think deep down, I forget... Um, multiple psychiatrists and psychologists, you know, famous ones, ones who have written books, et cetera. They all usually come back to the same point that technically at our core, a human being, mankind does want to make an impact. Once there's something deep seated in our psyche, or I think at the cellular level yeah. that I think all of us at some point or another, get that epiphany. Like mm -hmm. what can I do on this planet or in my life or in the world to right. leave a positive footstep behind? I truly believe that is in it us. It's it just some be. have awakened, some have not. Yeah, exactly. It has, you know, for the species to survive, we have to do, we have to make it better. It can't get worse because we won't survive. You know what I mean? That type of thing. Please don't but, make it worse. <laughs> yeah, please don't make it worse. <laughs> well, well, listen, uh, we do have to bring the show to a close. I do yeah. ask my guest co-hosts to leave a final message behind. And you're the perfect guy for it with everything you guys are doing. And for years, I just say, hey, you have some final words leave behind in case they forget everything else you said. But uh, in the past couple of years, I realized, no, there's that legacy, right? And your companies are already doing that. But like, what is an all-encompassing message you want to leave behind? You know, what is that legacy that you guys are, if you had to sum it all up from today's show, uh, what's, what would you like to leave behind for the people? You know what? The first thing that came to mind is, are you or are we being good ancestors? Are we leaving the planet better than we found? That's, if you measure everything by that, like it could be as far as raising children or however you show up in the community and, you know, brightening people's days. Like, I think it sounds simple, but that is the, the most powerful thing and supporting companies who are trying to do better. And hey, we're not perfect, but like companies, even big companies, if they're trying to make a little bit of change, like at least they're trying. I mean, we got to start somewhere, right? So yeah. that type of thinking. Well said, sir. I don't oh, think anybody's you. tied that to ancestral uh, responsibility. I All love right. that. Well, good stuff. <laughs> Listen, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Jeremy Lang. So again, we started off by talking about pilacases.com and then obviously closed out on lomi.com. Both sites, very informative, plenty of information for you. If you are a fellow earth nut geek about doing smart decisions, I'm not telling you to go buy stuff. 
obviously please do if you if you love it that much but if nothing else get informed um there's a lot of actual knowledge not even related to buying the products that you could really awaken yourself on on these sites so definitely check them out definitely support them if you if you see the fruition of all their hard work <laughs> <laughs> and remember we're here to fuel your health your business and your lifestyle jeremy helped us do that today thanks for tuning in and remember you too can live the fuel and we'll talk to you guys again soon And you're clear. All right.